today's episode of Still To Be Determined, we're going to be talking about whether or not we should be getting amped up to go to the beach. That's right, everybody. <laughs> nice. We're going to be talking about Matt's most recent episode, How the Ocean Could Be the Future of Energy Storage. Hi, everyone. As usual, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi. I write some books for kids. And I'm all around inquisitive about things tech. And with me, of course, is the origin of this entire discussion, which would be <laughs> my brother, Matt who is the host of Undecided with Matt Farrell. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? I tired. You're tired? Yes. <laughs> many miles on my body. Many, many miles. Drove <laughs> uh, four and a half hours yesterday with my son and my partner to look at a college for said son. Mm -hmm. And how did that go? It went fine, but... Driving is always a chore. Yeah, it's exhausting. Uh, I do not do it at all regularly. I do not own a car. So this was a rental car and getting in and out of the city is always the hardest part. So you look at a map and you say, this is a three hour drive. Why does my GPS tell me it's going to be four and a half hours? It's because an hour and a half of that will be the final 17 miles. Yes. Whenever I come is, to visit you, yeah, it's always like, I come from Boston down to New York and it's like, it's a straight shot. And then the last like 10 miles, the last yeah. 10 miles usually takes like a third yeah. of the trip. Yeah. If there was an option where they said, okay, your GPS tells you that this is a three and a half hour drive. But when you get there, you will be smacked around for 40 <laughs> minutes by somebody <laughs> in the front yard of the house where you're trying to get. I would actually prefer that. <laughs> over the stress of driving. Yeah. Because part of the stress with me with driving is, of course, uh, maniac drivers. I'm surrounded on the road by people who apparently are completely impervious to damage or pain. I, <laughs> I myself am not. I drive with a sense of I am mortal. I could be harmed. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So this discussion that we're going to be having today as intriguing and interesting as i do find it our listeners may recognize a certain amount of uh sean not brain working time <laughs> sean okay. brain sean brain uh feeling weird so i apologize in advance for any times where i stumble over my words or i say something that be a little dumb having said that we are going to be talking about how the ocean could be the future of energy storage this episode dropped on april 26 2022 and it was almost like a part two to your previous episode. Because it was. <laughs> and what was interesting was. to me is as we were having our discussion around part one, which had to do with water batteries and the use of pumping water or other liquids to higher points to then allow them to use gravity to come down and run turbines and so on and so forth. As we were having that discussion, I thought in my head, I wonder if you could do anything with the oceans. I wonder if you could do anything where you submerge something and used air pressure. And, and I didn't go that direction. I didn't ask you about any of that, but I felt a little prescient as I was watching this yeah. episode. And I was just like, I am a genius. <laughs> I may be exhausted from my drive, but I am a genius. So you heard it here first, folks. But as we, as we get into the episode, one of the things that stood out was the amount of wear and tear. And this was in the comments from a lot of the viewers. They were saying things like what Alexander Linder said. Alexander says a lot of the problems with these energy storage solutions is that seawater is so corrosive that the yeah. 20 to 30 year life expectancy may or may not be overblown because of degradation of materials, especially that water bladder solution. Flexible plastics don't stay flexible for 20 years, even under optimal conditions. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but wonder if you saw anything around this research that indicated they were researching that aspect of this. Because if anybody's been to a dock, if anybody's been to a shipyard where they see large vessels and large amounts of equipment that are in seawater, mm -hmm. you see a lot of rust. You see a lot of things growing on the metal. And I am yep. curious about that aspect. It's very nice to say, look, it's going to cost us $12 million to take this giant ball and submerge it and attach it to the seafloor. 
it's another thing to say we're going to have to redo that every five years. Right. So did yeah, you see no, anything in that regard about how the research around the degradation of materials would be incorporated into these costs? Yes, they are doing testing. All of these companies are doing different kinds of testing to try to assess that aspect of it, which is how they come up with those time frames. But as you know, on paper, <laughs> what you come up with, because you can do um, accelerated testing of things like in solar panels, they do this, they do these lab experiments to solar panels to figure out how long they'll last. They basically put them through hell for a short period of time and they can extrapolate, okay, that is going to equate to maybe 30 year life. Right. They're doing similar things with this. Or the videos things. we've seen of cell phones in an environment where they are repeatedly dropped. Yes. From a, you know, six foot height just to test durability of. Right. So, so in this case, they're doing that kind of testing and they're trying to assess it for that, but it's also none of these things have actually been used for 20 to 30 years. So there's a difference between what you kind of come up with in a lab experiment versus what's going to actually last for that projected time. My hunch based on what I've read and seen is that it would be somewhat in the ballpark, but of course, real world may, <laughs> might take off five years or eight years off of that estimate, depending mm -hmm. on what, what's actually happening in the wild. How much of this is also incorporating the diversity of underwater environments around the world? Not all offshore sites mm -hmm. are built equal. No. And there are some places where the tidal currents might, in fact, be so strong as to yep. remove any availability of doing something like this. Like I'm thinking about one of the installation suggestions was you could have your wind turbines mounted directly above one of the pressure spheres that would allow that to then be directly underneath. If I understood what was being said in the video, the sphere could be directly beneath the wind turbine. And I thought, well, good luck doing that in the North Sea where wind swells of the waves are enormous and any attempt to put any kind of structures into that water might be laughed at at best by, <laughs> by engineers <laughs> and God. So my question is, what kinds of environments are they talking about when they're talking about doing stuff like this? You mentioned German research going into this. What, mm -hmm. is, the, what is the body of water that the German research is looking toward? And what other places around the world might be similar that would allow for this kind of installation? Well, mostly like for the European countries that are exploring this, they're looking at things like the Black Sea or like, you know, areas around the UK and, you know, Norway and stuff like that. So it's like they're probably focused more on those regions, but it doesn't mean that I, I get your point, but it feels to me like you probably could engineer a solution for pretty much anywhere based on what I was reading. It does seem like it's going to be a kind of a dicey situation for some locations. Like you could put theoretically put a wind turbine pretty much anywhere, but there are probably areas where the winds might get so <laughs> intense, right. it might just tear apart the wind turbine. Right. So it, it's, there's probably similar cases for this too. There's probably going to be restrictions if there's too much um, shear or like stress from the, the, the currents in the water. Mm -hmm. And how married is the underwater tech? The elements that were like the creation of solar or wind, which is creating power, which is then used to drive the liquid or air in or out of the chambers. How much of that could actually be on land and how much would actually be required to be close in proximity to oh. those devices? Like the the inclusion of the wind turbine as sort of a, this could be kind of a natural pairing of the wind turbine right above these spheres. And I understand the logic of that, but would that be a major requirement of this technology or could you in fact have, you know, a, you know, dozens of yards of lead that go from these underwater chambers to an onshore site that is doing things with solar or other forms of energy creation so that you would be doing things at a distance there, there's no restriction to that you could you could have a massive wind installation or solar installation on shore that's pumping this energy out the reason why you probably wouldn't want to do that is you're kind of 
shunting the energy a huge distance into the ocean to then have to shunt it all the way back. And there's going to probably be energy loss as right. part of that flow. Where part of the, I don't, I don't want to say the ingenuity or the ingeniousness of this structure would be if you have an offshore wind farm, you have to get that energy on shore anyway. So if your storage system is like right by it, you're not doing like a, a back and forth. You're just kind of going down and then, and then in. So it's kind of like a pit stop before it comes all the way in. So it's, it's going to be a little more efficient. There's going to be less cabling needed. So it's like, it's kind of optimizing the flow of the energy versus kind of like backtracking on itself. So, right. but there's no restriction to that, but you'd be, <laughs> it'd be a lot of cabling to go two ways when you'd only have to go one way if you do it from the ocean. Right. And there's the aspect of mobility that came into my mind as I was watching this with like floating solar panels, there would be an advantage to be able to essentially you could uncouple from one site and move them to another site. So that perhaps if your, your expectation around a certain season was, well, this is a, you know, 80% of the days are cloudy mm -hmm. during this period of year. So we move this site actually to another location to, to take advantage of a different time of year. Is that built into this as well? Or am I overthinking? Is this really kind yeah. of a, we've put these things in the ocean. This is the site of our power production. This is where we're doing this. You're overthinking it. It's like once you've, you're mooring something into a specific location and you're laying down all the cabling that's required to pick it up and move it would, it would not be worth the time or money to do that. Mm -hmm. You'd, you'd want to pick your placement of this up front to optimize the best performance as you can. Right. So th if you're going to be building, you're not going to want to build this in an area that's only going to be able to generate significant power for a third of the year. You're going to want to place it in a place that you know is going to be generating power all year round as best it can. Right. Lastly, there was this comment from George Pretnick and it tied into something that I had been thinking about. So I'm going to read his comment and then add on my own thoughts uh, and ask you to respond to both. George wrote, one very large problem with any subsurface energy generating device in salt water is anything below the surface is immediately colonized and occupied by all manner of ocean life forms, barnacles, clams, <laughs> coral, algae, and whatever else will grow and build on the surfaces inside and out, necessitating constant scraping and cleaning. This applies to fresh water as well. Zebra mussels clog water intakes in the Great Lakes and some major rivers. So I got to thinking about not only that as far as an impact on the device, but I was thinking as I was watching the video, has there been anything that you've seen around effectively biofuel in the form of these naturally occurring sea creatures or water creatures that would form in certain areas? Has there been any attempt to take that and be able to utilize that in some form of energy gener generation in the form of I don't know, algae or, or other forms of collecting of biomass by letting it simply grow in a place to then harvest it and use it in some way. Sort of. <laughs> the only thing I can say is there's algae into biofuel, but I've never seen where they will deliberately let algae grow kind of out of control in a natural environment, because if you do that, it could actually create problems. Mm -hmm. So for algae for biofuel, the the move is to try to do that in controlled environments like basically you're setting up a, a lab basically to generate this stuff right i haven't seen something that's just naturally taking the wildlife uh wind turbines that are offshore net, like the barnacles and all that stuff that grows on it it can be beneficial for that to happen for the ocean life because it gives the like coral reefs it gives them something to grow on and kind of right. to it can rejuvenate an area because they have these structures that they can then grow on. But it's a good point that that same thing's going to happen to these things that have to be moving and changing yeah. that could cause problems. So it kind of goes back to the original question that you raised in the beginning, which is how is this actually going to be impacted out in the wild? And so it's like, until we start getting these in pilot facilities, you know, those lab tests to project, we're not going to know exactly how long they'll last. Yeah. Or how difficult it will be to maintain it because that's going to be happening. It's hard to look into the future. It's hard to mm -hmm. tell how that's all going to be impacted. But as I mentioned earlier, I felt a little bit like I did look into the future when I was talking to you last week and thinking like, hmm, what about the ocean? So I'm asking <laughs> listeners 
when was a time that you felt like you had seen into the future? There are certain aspects of these videos that Matt puts together that sometimes feel like we are looking at science fiction that just happens to be happening now. Mm -hmm. Has there been a time when you've been watching these videos and been like, yeah, I thought of that. I, I had that idea. <laughs> Let us know in yeah. the comments. You can either drop it in the comments through the contact information in the podcast description, or you can just scroll beneath this video on YouTube and leave a comment there. And as always, please do consider reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts. I'm going to stop saying the word podcasts. <laughs> Wherever you found this, please go back there and leave a review. Please do share it with your friends. And if you'd like to support us more directly, you can go to stilltbd.fm and click the Become a Supporter button. That allows you to throw some coins at our head, and we do appreciate each and every bruise. All of that really does help to support the show, and thank you so much for listening or watching, and we'll talk to you next time.